Hey listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. We're back from Christmas and New Year's break with Professor Will McCaskill. In as much as Effective Altruism has a founder, Will's the guy. You may well have seen interviews with him already, but I think we found almost entirely new things to talk about here. If you'd like to learn more about pursuing careers in effective altruist organizations, academia, philosophy, or global priorities research, we've got links to our guides about all of those topics in the show notes. And if you enjoy the episode, why not recommend the show to a friend? That's how most people discover new podcasts, and I assume they'll be forever grateful. Without further ado, I bring you Will McCaskill. Today, I'm speaking with Professor Will McCaskill. Will will be well known to many people as a co-founder of the Effective Altruism community. He co-founded Giving What We Can, 80,000 Hours, and the Center for Effective Altruism, and remains a trustee of those organizations today. He did his undergrad in philosophy at Cambridge and his PhD in moral philosophy at Oxford. And he then became the youngest associate professor of philosophy in the world at 28, uh, again at Oxford University. He's also the author of Doing Good Better, How Effective Altruism Can Help You Make a Difference. So thanks for coming on the podcast, Will. Thanks so much for having me. I'm a really big fan of the 80,000 Hours podcast and... That's why I'm really excited to have this conversation. So uh, we're going to dive into your philosophical views, um, how you'd like to see effective altruism change, uh, life as an academic, and what you're researching now. But first, how did effective altruism get started in the first place? Effective altruism as a community is really the confluence of three different movements. One was GiveWell, co-founded by Ellie Hassenfeld and Holden Karnofsky. Second was Les Long, primarily based in the Bay Area. And then the third is the co-founding of uh, Giving What We Can by myself and Toby Ord, where Giving What We Can was encouraging people to give at least 10% of their income to whatever charities were most effective. And back then also had a set of recommended charities, which were Toby and I's best guesses about what are the organizations that can have the biggest possible impact with a given amount of money. And my path into it was really by being inspired by Peter Singer and finding compelling his arguments that We in rich countries have a duty to give most of our income, if we can, to those organizations that will do the most good. And since then, effective altruism really took off. I was very surprised. I was thinking of giving what we can as a side project by, you know, two not terribly organizationally competent philosophers. (laughs) Yet these ideas really seem to resonate with people. And that meant that local groups were set up all around the world. There's now about 100 local groups dedicated to the ideas of effective altruism. We started to apply uh, the idea of how do you do the most good to other areas, such as 80,000 Hours, which was launched in early 2011. And we started to think about different cause areas as well. So not just global poverty, but how can you do the most good in general? Maybe that's the de- reducing existential risks. Maybe that's improving the lives of farm animals. Many different areas. And it's been wonderful to see the confluence between these different groups, where now there's this vibrant community of thousands of people all around the world, of people who are really interested in answering the question, how can I do as much good with at least a significant part of my resources? There's a lot more we could say about the story of effective altruism over the last five or six years. But I think you've you've given some presentations about that at EA Global recently. So um, we'll we'll stick up a link to those rather than than just going over that again. Is that right? Uh, Yeah, I think many people will be bored of hearing about me and Toby in a graveyard (laughs) in 2009 at this point. All right. So so we'll try to say something new. Uh, But but to bring us up to the present day, until a couple of months ago, you were CEO of the Center for Effective Altruism. Is that right? But, But about a month ago, you stepped away from that role. That's exactly right. Uh, So I became CEO of the Center for Effective Altruism, uh, even though I was a co-founder of it for many years ago. I came back as CEO about a year and a half ago, and that was always intended to be an interim thing, where CEA was undergoing some big changes. It was consolidating many different projects and trying to update its mission in accordance with the amazing developments we've seen in the growth of the effective altruism community. And it was pretty clear that being CEO of this organization was not my comparative advantage. Uh, And so... It was an absolute pleasure to be able to hand over that position to Tara McCauley, who is absolutely fantastic in this position. She's one of the most productive, competent, sensible, smart people that I've ever met. And I'm extremely confident the CEA is going to thrive under her leadership. So uh, running CEA wasn't your comparative advantage. Uh, what is? I guess you're, you're being an actual academic now? Uh, hopefully that's <laughs> hopefully that's my <laughs> that's comparative <the> advantage. <laughs> yeah. So certainly it seems like I'm best positioned to focus on EA as an idea 
whereas Tada and the Center for Effective Altruism is focused on EA as a community. And so with respect to EA as an idea, my big projects at the moment are, one is I'm finishing up a book on moral uncertainty that I'm co-authoring with Toby Ord and Krista Bickfist. Uh, second is I'm helping to set up the Global Priorities Institute, um, which is the first academic institute devoted to addressing theoretical questions that are raised by effective altruism. And that's based in Oxford and is led by Hilary Graves and Michelle Hutchison. And then I'm also doing a little bit of work on academic research into the fundamental questions related to effective altruism. And I'm also doing a little bit of teaching, which is part of my role as an academic. Um, in particular, I'm giving a course on utilitarianism as part of the Oxford undergraduate course. So I've got another episode coming out with uh, Michelle Hutchinson about the Global Priorities Institute. So, may- so maybe let's let's pass on that one. But sure. but tell me more about this book on moral uncertainty. I've, I've been waiting for this for a while because I actually need to know how am I going to make decisions given that I'm not sure about what moral theory is correct. What, what kind of theory are you putting forward in this book? Uh, terrific. So introducing the core idea, we make decisions about under empirical uncertainty all the time. And there's been decades of research on how you ought to make those decisions. And the standard view is to use expected utility reasoning or expected value reasoning, which is where you look at the probability of different outcomes, the value that would obtain given those outcomes, all dependent on which action you choose. Then you take the sum product and you choose the action with the highest expected value. That sounds all kind of abstract and mathematical, but the core idea is very simple, where if I give you a beer and you, you, know, you think 99% likely that beer is just going to be delicious, um, give you a little bit of happiness, but there's a one in a hundred chance that it will kill you because I've, you know, poisoned it. Then it would seem like it's irrational for you to drink the beer, because even though there's a 99% chance of a slightly good outcome, there's a one in a hundred chance of an extremely bad outcome. In fact, that outcome's a hundred times worse than the pleasure of the beer is good. Probably more than a hundred times. I mean, at at least, (laughs) at least, yeah, that's all you need. In which case, the action with greater expected value is to not drink the beer. Uh, And so we think about this under empirical uncertainty all the time. We'll look at both the probability of different outcomes and how good or bad those outcomes would be. But then when you look at people's moral reasoning, it seems like very often people reason in a very different way, where I call this the football fan model of decision-making given moral uncertainty, where people say, well, I'm a libertarian, or I'm a utilitarian, or I'm a contractualist. At least moral philosophers speak this way. And then they just say, well... Given that, this is what I think I ought to do. So they're no longer treating, they're no longer thinking about uncertainty about uh, what matters morally. Um, Instead, they're just picking their favorite view and then acting on that assumption. But that seems irrational, given all we've learned about how to make decisions under empirical uncertainty. And so the question I address is, supposing we really do want to take moral uncertainty into account, how should we do that? In particular, it seems like the obvious, given the obvious analogy with decision making under empirical uncertainty, we should do something like expected value reasoning, where we look at the probability that we assign to all sorts of different moral views, and then we look at like how good or bad would this action be under all of those different moral views, and then we take the best compromise among them, which would seem to be given by the expected value under those different moral views. Why don't you think people have always been taking this approach? Why is this even, how can this be a new idea, really? It's a surprising fact that this is such a new idea in moral philosophy. There is a tradition of Catholic theologians working on this topic. And this was actually a big issue for them, in particular when you had different moral authorities, that is, different priests who disagreed. And there were actually a variety of views staked out about how you ought to resolve that disagreement. But in general, it is remarkably neglected. And I think there's potentially a couple of reasons for this. One is we actually just not very good at reasoning probabilistically in general. And there's a large psychological literature on that topic. And then secondly, we're particularly bad at reasoning probabilistically if you don't get feedback. And because morality, you know, if it's true, moral truths are necessarily true, you know, a priori, it's not the case that you're getting any like empirical feedback if you're not acting in this way. And so it's just in general very easy, I think, to make kind of deep moral mistakes, because the only way you can find out if you're right or wrong is by kind of moral reflection. I'm curious to know what, 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 what the Catholics did. I guess they, they had an issue where, you know, one priest thought that it was you know, wrong to eat fish on a Friday, and another one said actually it was fine. And I suppose they could say, well, you should just be extremely cautious and never do anything that might be wrong. That'd be one approach. Uh, yeah, so they were actually... A number of different approaches. One that was saying, well, if it's probably the case that this action is permissible, 
then you can act on it. It's permissible to do so. Another view was, well, if it might be the case that it's impermissible, then you shouldn't. Mm. Another view was actually quite similar to the expected value view, where you wanted to take into account both disagreement and the severity of the sin that you would commit. And interestingly, they actually seem to abandon that view for reasons that are really troubling moral philosophers today who are engaging with the issue, which is this problem of intertheoretic value comparisons. I think I said it uh, was prohibited to eat fish on a Friday. I think I might have, got, might have gotten that that's the wrong way around. <laughs> Maybe you can tell I'm not a Catholic. But. Yeah. So it sounds like if you take the expected value approach, then things might be quite straightforward. You just uh, you know give different probabilities uh, to different uh, moral theories. You look at how good or bad different actions are given those different moral mm-hmm. theories. Is there even that much more to say about this? It seems kind of easy. Uh, if only that were true. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's not just one book's worth of content in terms of addressing some of the problems that this face. I think it's probably many volumes. So first is the question of just, well, how do you even assign credences to different moral views? That's already an incredibly difficult question. It's not the question I address, because that's just the question of moral philosophy, really. And then secondly, is supposing you do have a set of credences across different moral views, um, how do you act? And here are a few problems that you start to face. The first is, well, how do you make comparisons across different moral viewpoints. So let's say, again, this is a hypothetical thought experiment of if you can kill one person to save five people. The consequentialist view would say, yes, you ought to do that. It's very wrong if you don't do that, because four, four lives on net would be lost. The non-consequentialist view would say, no, it's extremely wrong to do that, because you're killing someone, and it's extremely bad to kill someone, even if that would produce better consequences. And now the question is, for whom is there more at stake? Is the consequentialist saying there's more at stake here? Is the non-consequentialist saying there's more at stake here? And how do we kind of address that question? So that's the first set of issues. Second, even deeper, is maybe some moral views don't even give you magnitudes of wrongness or magnitudes of value. So maybe it's the case that the non-consequentialist says, yes, it's, it's morally right to not kill the one person to save five, and it's wrong to kill one person to save five. But there's no meaning to say it's much more wrong to do that than it is to do some other thing. Maybe they just give you a ranking of options uh, in terms of choice worthiness. Um, A third problem is the fanaticism problem, which is the worry that perhaps under moral uncertainty, what you ought to do is determined by really small credences in infinite amounts of value or huge amounts of value, where perhaps, you know, absolutist views say that it's absolutely wrong to tell a lie, no matter how great the consequences. And perhaps the way you'd want to represent that is by saying that telling a lie is of infinite wrongness, whereas you know, saving lives or something isn't. And then if you've got this decision, I can, tell, I can save a lie, but I'll save a hundred lives by doing so. And let's suppose you have a one in a million credence that the absolutist view is correct. Well, one in a million multiplied by infinite wrongness is still infinitely wrong. And so telling the lie would still have lower expected choice worthiness than not telling the lie. But that just seems crazy. That seems like what we ought to do is just dominated by these fringe, fanatical-seeming views. I guess it could get even worse than that, because you could have one view that says that something is absolutely prohibited and another one that says that the same thing is uh, absolutely mandatory, and then you've got a completely undefined value for it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, So that's the correct way of thinking about this, that the problem of having infinite amounts of wrongness or infinite amount of, of rightness doesn't act as an argument in favor of one moral view over another, it just breaks expected utility theory, because some probability of infinitely positive value, some probability of infinitely negative value, you try to take the sum product over that, um, you end up just with undefined expected value. And there are other ways I think actually you can get on a similar problem, where, which I call class of infectiousness problems, where you've got small probabilities in really wacky moral views, and the issue is that the wackiness of that moral view infects the whole expected utility calculation. What, what's an example of that? Uh, well, another example would be the problem of infectious incomparability, which mm. I wrote an article on, where you know some moral views say that different sets of values are just absolutely incomparable. Mm. So if you're choosing between improving the lives of people and preserving the natural environment, there's at least some views that say, well, both of these are of value, but they're absolutely incomparable. So any time you make a trade-off between improving people's lives and at the expense of preserving the natural environment, there's just no fact of the matter about whether that's good or bad, um, because you're trading off two just radically different sorts of values. And the issue is that if you have a even a small probability in that being the case, 
of you know these two things being undefined in value essentially. And then again, you try to use expected value theory, even if you've got a very small probability in the incomparability. In incomparability, the whole expected the expected value is also incompa incomparable. It's also undefined which action has the highest expected value because of the tiny chance that they're completely radically incomparable. I guess one way of thinking about it is almost every moral theory has some kind of strange uh, outcomes or, or and that some of them fit oddly with expected value theory. And then if all of them have like some non-zero probability of being true, then when you uh, try to put them all together into some moral uncertainty framework, you end up with the bugs of all of them in, in your theory all at once. Yeah, exactly. Could you end up with the problem of having two basically identical theories of uh, morality, but one of them says that everything is more important than the other? So you've got like classical utilitarianism version one, which you know gives, gives the same rank ordering as classical utilitarianism version two, but version two says everything is 100 times more important as version one. Great. I think this is actually a key issue in the debate on moral uncertainty, and there's two ways that you can go. And I call this the distinction between structuralists and non-structuralists. So giving a bit of context, going back to uh, this question of inter-theoretic comparisons of value, what the structuralists want to do is say, okay, we look at all of these different moral theories, and then we just look at some structural features of the different theories' value functions. So one naive way of doing it might be you look at what's the best option and the worst option across all different moral views, and then you say, okay, I'm going to let all of those be equal so that every option's best option and worst option is equally good. And that's how I make comparisons of value or choice worthiness across different moral views. That obviously doesn't work for theories that are unbounded, that have no best or worst. So it's, it's not a very good proposal. A better one was suggested by Owen Cotton Barrett, and he actually proved some interesting results for suggesting that this is the best structural account, is normalizing different moral views at the variance of their value functions. So saying for every different moral view, the mean value or choice worthiness of options is the same, and one standard deviation of goodness or choice worthiness is the same across all moral views. But note that if you have that way of resolving different, of making comparisons of choice worthiness across different moral views, you can't have this idea that different moral theories can be identical in the structure or of their ranking of options, but say that one is just way, is just much more important than another. Because it just gets downweighted, basically. Because it would just get downweighted, because plus this utilitarianism one and utilitarianism two, where utilitarianism two is allegedly thinks that everything's 10 times more important, they have the same, you know, if you're normalizing at the variance, then their mean and standard deviation would be the same. And it would mean that actually it's not really 10 times as important. Um, it would be equally, everything would be equally important. However, I actually think that is a coherent possibility. I think you yeah. can have... It's very convenient just to wish that away. Yeah, but I, yeah, but I think actually there are the good arguments for thinking that you can have one moral view that's identical in what's called its cardinal structure. So it's exactly the same ranking of um, options in terms of how good or bad or right or wrong they are. But one just thinks that everything is way more important than others. Uh, and I think there's a few ways of seeing this, but the key thing is to appreciate that different moral views can differ not just in how they rank options, but also in what philosophers call their right makers. So kind of what's the metaphysical grounds for uh, thinking that certain entities have value or not? So, and so, so it's the thing that makes it true. Things that makes it true, exactly. So imagine someone starts off with a kind of partialist consequentialism. So I'm a, co I'm a utilitarian and so or consequentialist insofar as I just want to maximize the good. But I think that, you know, my friends and my family count, let's say, a hundred times as much as the welfare of distant strangers. And then suppose that person revises their view such that they have everyone being equally weighted. It seems like there's two ways of revising that view. One is to think, oh, I had these special obligations uh, with respect to my friends and family. Actually, that just doesn't make any sense. All that matters is just improving you know, improving the amount of welfare in the same way as I would think about strangers. So that person downweights how much they care about their friends and family. We can call it, let's say, call it like Benthamite utilitarianism. Second way, though, that she could change her views is by thinking, oh, no, actually, I'm kind of like a brother to all. It's arbitrary that I have these close relationships with my friends and family and not with strangers. And if only I could get to know them, I would have the same sort of relationships. And that means that, you know, if I fail to benefit a distant stranger, I'm actually kind of doing two things wrong. One is that I'm failing to promote that welfare in this kind of impartial sense, but also I'm kind of violating the special bond that I have to each and every person. And you call that a kinship utilitarianism. 
And so it's double wrong. It's double wrong. <laughs> That's right. There's two things making the action wrong. Mm. And it's just that those two things always go in step. And so that suggests that, look, we can distinguish these two moral views yeah. because they have two different facts. They have two different mm. features, right makers. And unless we're already committed to this kind of structuralist view, it seems like there's no reason why we think that they have to then equal each other in terms of strengths of rightness or wrongness. And you can think of other things like... You know, you might have different credences in these two different moral views, for example, because you think, wow, it's totally absurd to think that, uh, you know, special obligations exist, let alone that special obligations exist to everyone. Yeah. You might just think that's so implausible. It also seems like what attitudes might be fitting could vary between these two views as well. So you know, consequentialists don't care much about fitting attitudes, but many other philosophers do, where supposing you start off with uh, this partialist consequentialism, and then you move to the Benthamite view, it might be fitting to be kind of sad. It might be fitting to think, wow, there's just way less value in the universe than I thought. Because and I don't have special obligations anymore. That's right. Yeah. This special relationship well, I thought I had. Special my... obligations to everyone, but special obligations nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, so in the first view, you might just think, wow, it's kind of sad that my morality is so thin. It's just about promoting welfare, but kind of impartially considered. Mm. Whereas in the second view, you might think, wow, oh my God, um, it's actually, you know, might be kind of inspiring, might be fitting to feel that way where suddenly you feel much more connected to mm. everyone else in the world. And then finally, I think, you know, unless you're question begging, it seems to make a difference under um, moral uncertainty too. And then I think there are independent arguments against structuralist views, which then I think give further support to the idea that you might have what I call amplified theories. Is this like the two envelope paradox? It's really reminding me of that. You do get two envelope style problems under moral uncertainty, but that would determine more what credences you give to different views okay. rather than whether this is possible. So here's a case which is, okay, I think that humans are super valuable and non-human animals are not very valuable. Then I move to a view where I say, well, they're equally valuable then you might say, whoa, so animals are just way more important than I thought. But it could also be the case that you think, no, humans are just less important than I thought. And which way you go makes a big difference to how you handle uncertainty between those two different moral views, where it's only if you're boosting up the value of animals, do you... Only that, that will then start to dominate. That starts equation. to dominate. And if you don't, then it doesn't. Mm. And what credence you assign to those two different views has a has at least a two envelope sort of feel to it. Yeah, if you haven't heard of the two envelope paradox, it's a real treat. I'll, I'll stick up a link to that and you should definitely check it out. It's uh, one of yeah. my favorite paradoxes. <laughs> Why do you call it a structuralist view? Where does the structure come into it? Uh, the idea is it's just only looking at structural features of a moral theories. Well, what's a structural what I feature? What call choice worthiness function. A structural feature like the mean or the range or one standard deviation. The idea is like all I need to give you is options and numbers. the nu and numbers basically, and then you have everything you need to know. Perhaps it's like moral, moral philosopher, or statistician, basically. Yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. Perhaps they're not the best terms, but yeah, um, that's what we got. Okay, so to begin this th with, this all sounded very promising. We're just gonna do the math, but now it sounds like we're in a, in a swamp here. We've got lots of different problems. We've got like fanaticism, or we don't know how to compare between them. I, I guess there's also. Uh, how do you compare between different meta-ethical theories? So what, what if like this, there's a theory that says, in fact, like nothing matters, then, then what do you do with that? Yeah, yeah. so there's meta-ethical uncertainty as well, uncertainty about the nature of morality. Meta-meta-ethical uncertainty too? Does it just keep going up? Uh, well, you can definitely have uncertainty about how you make decisions under moral uncertainty. And there's two ways to go there. One is to say, well, moral uncertainty is about what you rationally ought to do, given uncertainty about what you morally ought to do. And that makes sense because you're talking about two different types of oughts. There's rationality and there's morality. But then when you go up a higher level, you're saying, well, what rationally ought you to do, given you're uncertain about what you rationally ought to do? And you might go one of two ways. You might say, well, that's just getting into nonsense. You can't have a recursive function like that. Mm. But that feels kind of arbitrary. <laughs> and so you might instead want to say, no, you just keep going higher and higher up this level until either you get some sort of convergence or maybe you don't get convergence and there's just no fact of the matter about what you ought to do. And I'm most sympathetic to that latter view and also wrote a paper about the relevance of uncertainty about rationality or decision theoretic uncertainty in the context of Newcomb's problem. Yeah, I, I guess in, in defense of that perspective, that seems to show up again and again in philosophy, that you get like a justification that creates a need for another justification on and on indefinitely. That's right. And 
what philosophers have converged on is the idea that there's no fully internal justification. At some point, you always need to have a principle that just is justified, whether or not you believe it to be justified. The proposal I suggested, which is, well, you've just got all of these higher levels, and if they converge on a particular answer, then go with that. If they don't, then maybe there's no fact of the matter. Well, what if someone doesn't believe that principle, that that whole principle I just gave? What should they do then? And, you know, maybe say, okay, well, you've got to take that into account and take that into account in, you know, in some even more elaborate way. But every time I'm giving a certain account, I'm suggesting this is what you rationally ought to do, whether or not you believe it's what you rationally ought to do. Mm. And I think, it's some, I think what's true is at some point you have to have what are called external norms, which are things that you ought to do, whether or not, whatever you think about them. So we'll come back to Merlin certainly specifically in a minute. But my understanding with these kind of infinite regress cases was you could either just bite the bullet and say, it, yes, you have an infinite regress and like everything, like these things just keep justifying one another forever. Or you can have a circle where kind of A justifies B, which justifies C, mm-hmm. which justifies A. Or you have some bedrock principle that just like absolutely is true and doesn't require justification. And are you saying philosophers have tended towards that last view? Uh, they, then they, they don't want to accept infinite regress cases as just acceptable. That's the way the world is. Yeah, at least there's two understandings of that, that latter view, which one of which is, you know, this principle is just self-evidently justified. So that's what kind of Descartes thought about the existence of God, which then was a bedrock for his whole um, kind of epistemology, was just that you can reflect on the idea of God and see that he must exist. No one thinks this is a very good argument now, but that was his kind of hope. I'm sure some people do. But so yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like the proposition itself is self-justifying. Mm. But the much more common view is to be a kind of externalist, which is to say, I can be justified in believing, for example, that I have a hand, even if I'm not justified need to be careful to get this Mm. statement right. I can be justified in believing that I have a hand, even if I'm not justified in believing that I'm justified that I have a hand. So the idea is being in a certain causal connection with with my hand gives me justification. Mm. And that has nothing to do with my beliefs about justification. And so in a sense, that again stops the regress from the very beginning. But it's some external fact that that stops the regress rather than some internal fact about myself. Okay, well, so let's come back to moral uncertainty <laughs> decisions. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about skepticism. <laughs> uh, that, 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 was that was starting to get above my head right there. So I think we'll come back to the, to the simple stuff that I need to know to, to actually make decisions. So we, ha- we had this problem of intertheoretic comparison, not being able to do that. Then we had a seeming solution where we're going to normalize. So like no one theory can dominate. They're all going to get kind of a, weight, a weighting over the function in proportion to how likely they are. Yeah. But you don't buy that. So you, you, you're not going to accept that, that actually. So uh, wh- where do we stand? What, what kind of is your conclusion in your book? Okay, so ultimately, so supposing we do accept the amplified theories, now there's not really a question of inter-theoretic value comparisons. The question instead is how do you distribute your credences among all of these different possible variants of, say, utilitarianism? So we started off with this. Utilitarian says kill one person to save five. Non-consequentialist says, don't do that. And the way I presented it was if we have two theories and you're deciding how to compare the two. But instead, you've got an infinite family of theories. One which says, you know, it's very important and it's even more important and it's even more important or less important and less important on both sides. And so the question of how to make inter-theoretic comparisons actually boils down to the question that's much more like normal moral philosophy, which is, of these many different moral views, what credences ought you to have in them? And I think at that point, you can start to offer kind of tips, heuristics on what credences to have. So I think it would be very weird, for example, if I have two moral views and they differ just on the extension of bearers of value. So let's say one view is utilitarianism and says only humans are of value. The second is um, utilitarianism star that says humans and animals are of value. It would be really weird to have credence in those both those two different moral views, but give humans like a thousand times the weight, mm. because it seems like all they're doing is differing on how many things are the value, what mm. types of things are the value. And so there's a kind of principle of epistemic conservatism, such that if you're going to modify the view, modify it in as few ways as possible. Um, and that's the view that you should have highest credence in. Uh, so there's actually kind of two questions of the intertheoretic comparisons. One is the formal question of how do you make sense of this? Like, what makes it the case that these comparisons are meaningful? That's the very philosophical question. And the second, more practical question is, well, I've got these two theories. Like, actually, how do I compare them? And I'm saying that looks a lot more like first-order moral philosophy 
um, than people have normally suggested it to be. Just to clarify a little bit more, there's an analogy between this question and the question of interpersonal comparisons of well-being, where, again, I've got these two questions. So, you know, I pinch you and punch someone else. We have an you know, intuition of that saying that it's worse to get punched, worse for this other person to get punched than it is for you to get pinched. But then there's two questions. One is like, is that judgment true? And then secondly, if it's true, what makes it the case that this is true? And, you know, economists and philosophers have worked on that question for quite a while. Okay, so I imagine some listeners' heads are kind of spinning at, at all of this moral philosophy. Uh, what are kind of the practical takeaways that, that people should use in actually making decisions about what, what's moral, given what we know now about this issue? Yeah, I think there's still lots of open questions in what the practical implications are, but broadly I would sum it up as follows, where I think it means, and I'm in particular going to talk to people who come from more of a consequentialist sympathetic or utilitarian sympathetic perspective. So firstly, I think it means being very careful about violating rights. So there's two big ways in which consequentialism differs from non-consequentialism. One is that consequentialism says that the ends always justify the means, so there's no side constraints on actions. The second is that there's no realm of the permissible. There's no area that's just, it's okay for you to do whatever you, kind of you want. Everything that's not prohibited is obligatory, basically. It's, basically, it's something is either that, prohibited or obligatory. Basically, that's right. So for consequentialists, you know, buying yourself a nice meal because it's nice for you, even though you could use that money to do something else that would do more good, that would be wrong on consequentialism. And I think between non-consequentialism and consequentialism, they each one win one of those fights, as it were. So I think that in the case of violating side constraints, in those like kill one to save five cases and so on, I think in general, you know, you ought to go with a non-consequentialist view and not violate that side constraint because they think that's really high stakes in a way that the consequentialist view doesn't. Mm. Especially when we think about real-life cases, where mm. it's actually like pretty rare to think of cases where the consequentialist is really keen on violating a side constraint, mm. because there are normally good practical reasons for doing that too. But then I think that the consequentialist wins the battle of the permissible, because if I'm saying, well, I can either spend this money on myself or give it to somewhere where it'll do more good, the non-consequentialist will almost always say, it's permissible to do either. Whereas the consequence that says, well, no, it's impermissible to spend it on yourself, it's obligatory to spend it on others, in which case the consequentialist is thinking it's much more important than the non-consequentialist is. So you end up with this kind of, in broadly, this consequentialism plus rights view, where you, you ought to do as much good as you can, constrained by not violating anyone's rights. Uh, then the second aspect is with respect to what are you trying to maximize then on that consequentialist part. And I think that means you should give yourself a very broad understanding of what's valuable. So different views on population ethics differ in terms of maybe it's only people that will definitely exist that you want to benefit or that it's morally important um, to benefit or to not harm. Um, many other views of population ethics say that, well, it's actually good if you can bring more people with really positive lives into existence. That's a morally important thing to do. You're making the world better. And I think in combination with the premise that there are just so many potential people in the future if the human race doesn't go extinct, you know, trillions upon trillions of people in the future. That means that that kind of long-term future view becomes very important. So in, in effect, you, you, diminish the va you might diminish the value of benefiting uh, future people or bringing future people into existence compared to benefiting present people. Now, you give present people a little bit more weight, but because the stakes are so high, actually, in general, you should, you know, take very focus on the very long run future, because there's just so much potential value at stake, even if you don't find population ethical views like the total view, or other views that think that it's good to bring really happy people into existence, and bad to bring really unhappy people into existence. Even if you don't find them that plausible, because the stakes are so high, you should really focus on that. And a very similar argument, I think, goes for caring about non-human animals as well even if you don't find it very plausible. There's just, you know, so much you can do to benefit them and the suffering they have in the world today is so great. Though I think when you do the numbers, it's still very small compared to the number of future creatures, both humans and non-human animals. Uh, and then the third um, aspect, I think, is taking what I call the, model va the value of moral information very seriously, where if you really appreciate moral uncertainty, and especially if you look back through the history of human progress, we have just believed so many morally abominable things and been, in fact, you know, very confident in them. 
If you just look at... Slavery is a positive good. It's the natural order of things. It has to be that way. That's right. And even for people who really dedicated their lives to trying to work out the moral truth. So Aristotle, for example, was incredibly morally committed, incredibly smart, way ahead of his time on many issues, but just thought that slavery was a precondition for some people having the good things in life. And um, therefore, it was justified on those grounds, a view that we'd now think of as completely abominable. And so that makes us think that, wow, we, should pro- we probably have mistakes similar to that, really deep mistakes that future generations will look back and think, this is, you know, this is just a moral travesty that people believe this. And that means I think we should place a lot of weight on yeah, moral option value and moral, gaining moral information. So that means just doing further work in terms of figuring out what's morally the case, you know, doing research in moral philosophy and so on, studying it for yourself. But then secondly, into the future, ensuring that we keep our options open. And I think this provides one additional argument for ensuring that the human race doesn't go extinct for the next few centuries. And it also provides an argument for the sort of instrumental state that we should be trying to get to as a society, um, which I call the long reflection. So humanity should thrive and grow and then just turn over entire planets to academic philosophers like you. Is that, <laughs> is that, the, is that the view? I mean, it might be uncharitable there. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously the conclusion of a moral philosopher saying, well, moral philosophy is incredibly important, you know, might seem very self-serving, but I think it is kind of straightforwardly the implication that you get if you um, at least endorse the premises of taking moral uncertainty very seriously and so on. And if you think we can at least make some progress on moral philosophy. And so if you reject that view, you have to kind of reject one of the underlying premises. I had a bunch of follow-ups there. So it sounds like you, you, there's two you know, kind of strong dominance arguments that you've been willing to accept here. Mm-hmm. Well, one is the deontological arguments against murder. You have to say, well, don't murder except in very unusual circumstances, even if it looks good on other theories. Yeah. We want to keep uh, humanity around and potentially you know, increase the number of beings that exist because that's um, plausible under some utilitarian views. Mm-hmm. What about you know, odd conclusions that you might get from virtue ethics or subjectivist theories or contractualism or all of that. Are there other, other things that we're ignoring here? Yeah, I mean, so I've given a very broad brushstrokes kind of categorization of the landscape. But in general, the non-consequentialist, you know, the broad brushstrokes is between the non-consequentialist views on side constraints and the consequentialist um, views that uh, reject them. And so between various forms of virtue ethics and typical, I mean, what I call somewhat pejoratively, no theory deontologists, mm. which is probably the most common view among moral philosophers, where they just have they don't have any over, overarching moral theory, but lots of like pieces of non-consequentialist moral theory. There aren't so many things that those views endorse that are like radically at odds with the consequentialist view. Okay. Uh, there's no case that. where, where virtue ethics says, oh, you absolutely must be courageous in this situation, no matter what the consequences. <sighs> yeah, it's not as extreme in that way. So, you know, some moral... Some virtue ethicists say, well, you have an obligation to perfect yourself, to work on your own skills and so on. But that's not a case where there's going to be like a really big tension. So so firstly, if you don't do that, it's not like they're saying this is the worst thing ever. But it's also, yeah, not the case that there's like a really big tension between what you might want to do anyway. And those are the cases which are kind of most interesting from the moral uncertainty perspective. Maybe you haven't looked into this yet, but what about anything from continental philosophy? Do they have any you know, really strong arguments that might feature in the equation, even if you think that they're fairly unlikely to be true? I mean, there's things related to the idea of um, exploitation mm. um, could be relevant. So, you know, this is a view that I find very hard to understand or sympathize with, is if you and I engage in a, tra- in a trade, let's say, but I'm much richer than you are. Um, and so you, the background is unjust because I have more resources than I ought to have. But you're perfectly rational and so on, and you engage in a kind of voluntary trade. And so that's making everyone kind of better by their own lights. A lot of moral views, especially kind of informed by Marxist theory, might say that's actually bad. Even though the situation has improved both, both parties, including the worst off. And it was all consensual. And it was all consensual. That's still wrong because it's kind of exploitative. So, so a consequentialist and, might say in that case, well, this isn't the best thing that could happen because maybe the rich person should just give the poor person all their money. Yeah. But on some of these continental theories, they might say it's actually worse for them to interact and do this trade than to do nothing at all. Yeah. And so there's a v- variety of things you can say to kind of make more sense of this. You know, the consequentialist says, yeah, well, maybe focusing on how good this is is kind of meaning that you're not putting attention on the real thing, which is the unjust background condition. Or it makes even more salient the unjust background condition. But what the more Marxist-inspired theorist might say is just saying that's not really consensual. You having this choice in such a constrained circumstance where you're so badly off 
you just can't make a kind of consensual choice um, because your options are already so limited. And that's why it's that's why it's wrong. And so, but what I want to do is put that kind of into the side constraints, mm. that kind of side constraints bucket as well. So if I was a co- corporation, let's say, and let's say I could pay, you know, I'm earning to give as a coffee producer and Starbucks or something. And I'm even in the case, I'm planning to donate all of my profits. Mm. And so therefore I calculate that I could do more good by paying you the minimum that I can get away with and then donating the excess. I think under moral uncertainty, I shouldn't do that. Mm. Um, I should pay you more, what's closer to a kind of fair wage, reducing the amount of good I can do, but ensuring that I avoid violating the side constraint of exploiting you. So that's one case. In other times, you know, a lot of continental philosophers are, you know, engaged in a very different project than analytic philosophers are. And it's Um, not clear how you would bring them into some comparable... That's right, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of continental philosophers would just think, as soon as I've started to model morality using these analytic tools, I'm bothering from economics and so on, I'm already completely on the wrong path. Morality is not an algorithm. It's about using your judgment Mm -hmm. in particular cases. And uh, trying to impose formal structure is just automatically going to lead you in the wrong direction. This, again, comes to this kind of meta-model uncertainty of maybe, you know, this whole formal framework is totally the wrong way to go. But again, it's just not really clear what you do under that circumstance. Mm. A thing that I hear from a lot of people is that they just don't believe that anything is right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Uh, Does the moral uncertainty stuff apply to to them as well? Uh, Yeah, I think it does. And there's an interesting argument in this area, which is, suppose you just have this view, and even suppose you're pretty confident in it, 90% confident that nothing is right and nothing is wrong. So you're a nihilist or error theorist, as philosophers say. Well, now suppose you're actually making decisions. Should you give some of this money to you know, cost-effective charity? Well, 90% of your credence says doesn't matter either way. You don't do anything wrong if you do, but you don't do anything wrong if you don't either. Um, so that doesn't really weigh in the reasons about what you ought to do. But you've got this 10% credence that know there are facts of the matter about what's right and what's wrong. And it says, let's suppose, that it's really important to give the money to the effective charity rather than keep it for yourself. Well, then there's nothing to be lost by doing so. There's nothing to be lost by acting as if it is the case or, you know, taking as a practical assumption that it is the case that some things are right and wrong. Because nothing is valuable and nothing is wrong and nothing is right. Yeah, because from the nihilist perspective, you're not doing anything wrong. There's just no reason to do anything. From the moral realist perspective or the, you know, understood broadly as just saying there are some things that are right and some things are wrong. It's very important not to do that. So there's a kind of dominance argument there. And I actually think, you know, I've written about this topic. I actually think that argument that I've given you is just much harder to make out formally. It sounds very simple. I think it's actually very complex. And I have this kind of belief that that argument does work. (laughs) That you'll find a way. Yeah, and that the difficulties in making it work is just a matter of ironing out some bugs Mm. in some uh, some philosophy. But I do think it's actually, the argument isn't as simple as it looks. That's that paper, The Infectiousness of Nihilism, right? That's that, yeah. Yeah, I'll stick up a link to that. So before you mentioned that if humanity doesn't go extinct in the future, there might be a lot of time and a lot of people and very educated people who might be able to do a lot more research on this topic and Mm -hmm. figure out what's valuable. So that that was a long reflection. What do you think that would actually look like in practice, ideally? Yeah, so the key idea is just different people have different sets of values and they might have very different views for like what does an optimal future look like. And what we really want, ideally, is a kind of convergent goal between different sorts of values so that we can all say, look, this is the thing that we're all getting behind, um, that we're trying to ensure that humanity, kind of like this is the purpose of civilization. And the issue, if, if you think about purpose of civilization, is just you know, so much disagreement. But maybe there's something we can aim for that all sorts of different value systems will agree is good. And then that means we can really get coordination in aiming for that. I think there is an answer. I call it the long reflection, um, which is you get to a state where existential risks or extinction risks have been reduced to basically zero. It's also a position of, you know, far greater technological power than we have now, such that we have, you know, basically vast intelligence um, compared to what we have now. Amazing empirical understanding of the world. Secondly, tens of thousands of years to you know, not really do anything with respect to, you know, moving to the stars or, you know, really trying to actually build civilization in one particular way, but instead just to engage in this research project of what actually is of value, what actually is the meaning of life, and have, you know, maybe it's 10 billion people um, debating and working on these issues for uh, 10,000 years, because the importance is just so great, because humanity or post-humanity might be around for you know, billions of years, in which case spending a mere 10,000 is actually absolutely nothing. Mm. And in just the same way as if you think as an individual, 
uh, how much time should you spend reflecting on your own values before choosing your career and you know committing to one particular path? Probably at least a few minutes. Or at, at least, least like, a few at minutes. Point one percent of the whole time. Exactly. And when you're thinking about the vastness of the potential future of civilization, the equivalent of just a few minutes is is tens of thousands of years. And then there's questions about well, how exactly do you structure that? I think it would be great if there was more work done and you know really fleshing that out and perhaps that's something you'll have time to do in the near future but one thing you want to do is just have as little locked in as possible so you want to be very open both on you don't want to commit to one particular moral methodology you just want to commit to things that seem extremely good from basically whatever moral view think you might think ends up as correct or what moral epistemology might be correct so just people having a higher iq but everything else being equal. That just seems strictly good. Mm -hmm. People having greater empirical understanding just seems strictly good. People having a better ability to empathize, uh, that all seems extremely good. People having more time seems extremely good. Having cooperation seems extremely good. And then I think, yeah, like I say, many different people can get behind this one one vision for what we want um, humanity to actually do. And that's potentially exciting because we can have this convergent goal Mm -hmm. that we're coordinating among. And it might be that one of the conclusions we come to is you know, it takes moral uncertainty into account. We might say, actually, there's some fundamental things that we just can't uh, can't ultimately resolve, and so we want to do a compromise between them, where maybe that means that for civilization, part of civilization is devoted to common sense, you know, thick values of pursuit of art and, and flourishing and so on, whereas large parts of the rest of civilization are devoted to other values, like pure bliss, the most amazing kind of blissful states and so on. And you can imagine compromise scenarios there where, you know, it's just large amounts of civilization. Hmm. You know, the the universe is a big place. So So if we can't figure out exactly the one thing that's definitely valuable, then we could do a mixture of different things. That's right. All right, so that was quite a while on moral uncertainty, but we've kind of only, kind of only scratched the surface of what I imagine is, is in the book. Uh, when, when's the book coming out? Probably still a while. Okay. Um, well, I need to finish the thing and submit it, and then it'll go through peer review. Yeah. Um, so maybe think a year to a year and a half is when the book will actually come out. Yeah. And it's an academic book, so if your mind was reeling from some of the more theoretical moral philosophy that we were talking about, there's a lot more of that in the book. <laughs> Um, we have a very smart audience, Will, so I'm sure, I'm sure they'll all go out and buy it and, I, and, uh, and fill up the auditoriums on your, on your tour. I bet. What, what's, the, what's the book going to be called? Do you know yet? Moral Uncertainty. Moral Uncertainty. Okay, cool. You're really staking out the territory. Yeah. Taking moral uncertainty seriously is uh, slightly unusual uh, in, in, in philosophy, at least taking it quite this seriously. What are some of the most unusual uh, philosophical positions that, that you hold uh, relative to your profession anyway? So in general, I try and form beliefs that take disagreement among my peers kind of very seriously. And that means that in general, my views are actually pretty moderate with respect to other philosophers. So my you know, credence in consequentialism versus non-consequentialism is actually about 50-50 even if I find the arguments for uh, consequentialist positions more compelling in general. Loads of people disagree with me, so I take that into account. But then when I'm in the seminar room, it's a little bit different. I uh, will be more inclined to kind of stake my position because the question isn't in the seminar room, what exactly are the correct views after updating on disagreement? It's about trying to work out the merits of different views, just taking the first as a first order question. And there I'm probably most distinctive in thinking that people just aren't taking seriously enough the arguments for classical utilitarianism, mm. which is the utilitarian theory of the good. So that says you just add up well-being across different people. Hedonism as a theory of welfare. So the only things that are good or bad are conscious states. And then also the total view mm. of population ethics. So saying that the goodness or badness of a state is just given by the total well-being, mm. where you can increase the amount of well-being in the world by adding people as well as by improving the lives of people who are already there. And I think there's just a number of arguments in favor of this. And moral philosophy at the moment, I think, is either often not fully aware of how strong the arguments are, or dismissive of utilitarianism for very, for weak reasons. So it seems like through history, the, pop- the popularity of utilitarianism has kind of waxed and waned. Uh, mm-hmm. It was like a period in the ancient Greek world where it was like qu- quite a popular view. Uh, it seemed like you know when Bentham was writing, uh, it, w- it was quite a fashionable view. It's currently not super fashionable or hasn't been so much lately. That's right. So in terms of at least recent history, um, there was Bentham and Mill and then Sidgwick in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And in the early 20th century, it was extremely common. It was basically the dominant view among moral philosophers. And then there was a kind of dry patch with respect to moral philosophy because a meta-ethical view 
called emotivism or prescriptivism had become very dominant, Mm -hmm. which has said that when we do moralizing, we're just expressing our attitudes towards things. We're Mm -hmm. just saying yuck to murder and hooray to giving to charity. And and then there's not a lot of substance And then there's just not much to do because it's just that we're jeering for different football teams. There's not really a subject matter of moral philosophy. And then the big change really happened in the early 70s with John Rawls publishing A Theory of Justice. Mm -hmm. And that's not the only change, but he really reinvigorated the idea that you could do moral philosophy. That partly came from a different meta-ethical view, which was kind of constructivism, Mm. thinking of what you're doing morally is like linguistics, where linguistics, you just take all of these intuitions that we have about what things are appropriate to say and what are not, kind of grammatically speaking, and then you build a set of rules around to make sense of that. He thinks that we could do the same um, for morality. Um, And even though there's no ultimate fact about what is morally correct or not, you can still come to kind of a better understanding of what my, or at least our, um, moral tu- intuitions are, and kind of moral framework is, in the same way as, like, there genuinely is a discipline of linguistics, and it's, the results of that are non-obvious. So that was the first thing he did. And then secondly, he had a bunch of trenchant arguments against utilitarianism. And then finally suggested this uh, methodology that ties to his constructivism of reflective equilibrium, where the, way, the methodology for making progress in moral philosophy and political philosophy is to go in a back and forth between intuitions that you have about particular cases, like don't kill one person to save five, and more theoretical judgments that also seem plausible, like if you can make some people better off and no one worse off, that thing is a good thing to do. That would be a kind of theoretical judgment, not about a particular case, that seems very compelling. And so then since Rawls, the dominant paradigm has been this, what again kind of call a no-theory deontology, or non-consequentialism has become much more, much more widely accepted, and now the kind of ratio of philosophers is maybe two-thirds non-consequentialist to one-third consequentialist. And my view is that as philosophers' understanding of meta-ethics has changed quite a bit mm. since Rawls, now kind of moral realism and even quite staunch moral realism is much more widely endorsed. But I think what hasn't happened is that philosophers haven't seen the link between meta-ethics and moral methodology, and from there the move to for what first-order normative theories you should endorse where I think if they did see that more clearly, that would result in a greater support for views that are more at odds with common sense, like Mm. classical utilitarianism. All right, straight out, what what are the arguments for classical utilitarianism? Yeah, so I think there's at least kind of half a dozen that are very strong. Um, One is... Well, they don't all have to work then. (laughs) (laughs) It's true, yeah. We've got a bunch of options, all right. I mean, one that I think doesn't often get talked about, but I think actually is very compelling, is the track record. Um, So when you look at scientific theories, how do you decide whether they're good or not? Well, significant part by the predictions that they made. And we can do that to some extent, got a much smaller sample size, you can do it to some extent with moral theories as well, where, for example, we can look at what the predictions, the bold claims that were going against common sense at the time that Bentham and Mill made, compare it to the predictions, bold moral claims that Kant made. So when you look at Bentham and Mill, they were extremely progressive. They campaigned and argued for women's right to vote and the importance of women getting a good education. They were very p- positive on sexual liberal attitudes. In fact, some of Bentham's writings yeah. on the topic were so controversial that they weren't even published 200 years later. Um, I, I think, so Bentham thought that homosexuality was fine. And yeah, it should be decriminalized, absolutely. Yeah, at, at the time, time it was, it was like just, basically the, the only person who thought this. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, this yeah. He was far, he- far ahead of his time on that. Also with respect to animal welfare as well. Progressive, even with respect to now, both um, Bentham and Mill were very emphasised greatly the importance of um, treating animals well. They did, weren't perfect. I mean, the, the Mill and Bentham's views on colonialism pretty distaste, pretty distasteful from perspective of the day. But, but they were against slavery, right? My understanding is, yeah, yeah, yeah. but um, they did have yeah pretty regressive attitudes towards colonialism, mm. judged from today, like it's you know common at the time. But um, that was not something that whether. Yeah, on the right yeah. side of history. Yeah. I guess Mill actually worked in the colonial office uh, for India, right? That's right. And yeah. he thought it was fine. Yeah, that's right. That's not, not so great. Not, that's not a winner there. But. Yeah. I don't think he defended it at length, but mm. in casual comments, he mm. um, thought it was fine. Contrast that with Kant. Mm. So here are some of the views that Kant believed. Um, one was that suicide was wrong, and one was that masturbation was even more wrong than suicide. <laughs> Another was that organ donation is impermissible, and that even cutting your hair off to give it to someone else is not without some degree of moral error. N- not an issue that we're terribly troubled by today. Exactly. Not really the thing that you would you know, stake a lot of moral <laughs> credit on. Um, he thought that women have no place in civil society. Uh, he thought that 
illegitimate children, it was permissible to kill them. And then he thought that there was a ranking in the moral worth of different races, uh, with unsurprisingly white people at the top, then I think Asians, then Africans, and then Native Americans. He, he was white, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, coincidence. A fortunate yeah. coincidence, I suppose, yeah. for him. So I don't want this to be a pure ad hominem attack on Kant, because there's an underlying lesson to this, which is when we look at the history of moral thought and we look at all of the abominable things that people have believed and even felt very strongly about, we should think, well, it'd be extremely unlikely if we're not in the same circumstance. We probably believe lots of really, like as common sense, believe lots of truly abominable things. And that means that if we have a moral view that's just all about catering to our current common sense intuitions... We're probably just enshrining these biases and these moral errors. And so what we want to have instead is a moral view that criticizes um, common sense so that we can move beyond it. And then when you look at how utilitarianism has fared historically, it seems to have done that in general, not always, but in general done that very well. And that suggests that that kind of progress might continue into the future. Mm. And that in as much as the conclusions are surprising to us now, well, the conclusions from the past were surprising people in the past, but we agree with them now, so we shouldn't be too surprised. Absolutely. Okay, so, so that was argument one of six. I, <laughs> might, I might have to keep you to three so we can finish, uh, finish today. Yeah. Um, so what, what are the other best two arguments for utilitarianism? So the other best two, I think, are one is Hoshanyi's veil of ignorance argument, and the second is the argument that moves from rejecting the notion of personhood. Uh, and so we can go into the first one, Hashani's Veil of Ignorance. So John Hashani was an economist, uh, but also a philosopher. And he suggested the following thought experiment, which is uh, morality is about being impartial. It's about taking a perspective that's beyond just your own personal perspective, somehow from the point of view of everyone or society or point of view of the universe. And so the way he made that more precise is by saying, assume you didn't know who you were going to be in society assume you had an equal chance of being anyone. And assume now that you're trying to act in a rational, self-interested way. You're just trying to do whatever's best for yourself. How would you structure society? What's the principle that you would use in order to decide kind of how people do things as this perspective of the social planner? And he proved um, that if you're using expected utility theory, which we said earlier that is really well justified as a view of how to make decisions under empirical uncertainty and you're making this decision, the rule you'll come to is utilitarianism. You'll try and maximize the welfare of everyone, of the sum total um, of welfare in society. But because you care about each of those people equally, because you could be each of them with equal probability. Exactly, that's right. So that, that suggests that uh, when Rawls was saying, oh, behind a veil of ignorance, you'll, you'll like maximize the welfare of the minimum of the person who's worst off, that Great. he was mistaken about that Great. in some mathematical sense? He, I do think he was mistaken. I think that Rawls' veil of ignorance argument is the biggest own goal in the history of moral philosophy. I also think it's a bit of a travesty that people are so, think that Rawls came up with this argument. Yeah. In fact, he acknowledged that he took it from Arshani and changed it a little bit. Hmm. And Rawls' reasoning was as follows. Utilitarianism is false. Therefore, we can infer that the setup that Hashanyi chose was also false, was wrong in some way. And he just felt that this was self-evident? Yeah, that's right. He could just, you know, appeal to intuitive cases and so on where utilitarianism conflicts so badly with moral intuitions. But he thought he was attracted to this veil of ignorance argument as a form of argument. And so he tweaked the initial setup instead. He said that rather than knowing the probability of being each person in society... All the information you get behind this veil of ignorance is that there is some person at a given level of welfare. You don't know how many people are at that level of welfare. So it's in a more impoverished informational state where you can say, okay, I know that someone is at welfare level four and someone else is at welfare level 100. But I don't know how many people are at welfare level four, how many people are at welfare level 100. And I think there are two big problems with this. One is that this seems really unmotivated. It seems like the natural way of setting up this veil of ignorance is that you know the chance of being everyone, because everyone counts equally. That's, you know, again, the part of the thought of impartiality and morality is everyone counts equally, whereas if you just are forced to be blind about the fact that 100 people are at one level of welfare and only one at another, that seems like you're not counting the views or the weights of the 100 as well as you can for the weight of the, of the one. The second is then by looking at the implications of the view that he comes to where what he argues is that in conditions of you know, ignorance of probabilities, all you know is that you might end up at this level of welfare, you might end up at this other level of welfare, but you don't know the probabilities. You'd use a decision rule called maximin, where you ensure that the worst possible outcome you can end in 
you can end up in is as good as possible. And this would entail the moral rule, and again, this is provable, so from the setup, this strictly follows. That would entail a moral rule of called leximin, which is where you structure society so that the worst off person in society is as well off as you can make them. And that might, you know, sounds good, sounds kind of egalitarian, but has incredibly extreme implications. So supposing I can have two um, worlds. The first is where everyone in the world, literally everyone, all 7 billion people, have incredibly good lives, incredibly well off. But there's one person who's, um, you know, badly off, single person. In the second world, where everyone is as badly off as the worst off person. So all those 7 million people just have also really terrible lives. But that worst off person in the first world just has one dollar more, just slightly better off. Leximin, would entail, Rawls's view, would entail that latter distribution rather than that former distribution. Which and is course, perverse. Which is perverse. I mean, that just seems way more absurd to me than the utilitarian conclusions. But he must have immediately noticed that this was a conclusion of his theory, right? And that's that's right. It's and not really any more common sense than, than what he was trying to reject. I mean, that's my view, but he stood by this view. He did certain sorts of philosophical wrangling that make the view far less theoretically compelling and far more arbitrary, where... It wasn't the case that you literally look at the worst off member of society. Instead, you look at the representative of the working class. So you take some average among like the bottom, you know, maybe 10% or 20% and ensure that they're as well off as possible, which is now just throwing away all the theoretical elegance that we had behind this view or this argument. Mm -hmm. And you've suddenly got this view that sounds a bit like the first view you said, but isn't what's entailed by your original setup. And, I mean, it sounds like he started with political convictions and then was looking for a theory to justify it. Is that, is that fair? Uh, I think that's fair. I think that's, and the reason I think that's fair is that he's saying, well, this is reflective equilibrium. We're going between like intuitions about particular judgments and uh, theoretical considerations and then kind of going back and forth between the two. So in that sense... He would concede that that was part of what was going on. Uh, yeah, I think that would be a fair way to read him. Okay, and the, and the third argument for utilitarianism? Right, so then the third argument is... Uh, and I should say in all of these cases, there's more work you need to do to show that this leads exactly to utilitarianism. But uh, what I'm saying is this is the f these are the first steps in that direction. Uh, the third argument is rejecting the idea of personhood, or the at least rejecting the idea that who is a person and the distinction between persons are morally relevant. Where the key thing that utilitarianism does is say that the trade-offs you make within a life are the same as the trade-offs that you ought to make across lives. So I will go to the dentist in order to have a nicer set of teeth, inflicting a harm upon myself, because I don't enjoy the dentist, let's say, in order to have a you know, milder benefit over the rest of my life. But we wouldn't say you should inflict the harm of going to the dentist on one person intuitively in order to provide the benefit of having a nicer set of teeth to some other person. That seems weird intuitively. It'd be a very weird dental office. It would be a weird <laughs> dental office. Um, setting that aside. Setting and you that still wouldn't be... Setting that aside, right? yeah. But now suppose that we reject the idea that... There is a fundamental difference between me now and you now, whereas there's not a fundamental difference between me now and me age 70. Instead, maybe it's just a matter of degree. Um, or maybe it's just the fact that I happen to have a bundle of conscious experiences that is more interrelated in various ways by memory and foresight than, my, than this bundle is with you. And there's certain philosophical arguments you can give for that conclusion. So one of which is um, fission, what we'll get called fission cases. So imagine that you're in a car accident with uh, two of your siblings. And in this car accident, your body is completely destroyed. And the brains of your two siblings are completely destroyed, but they still have functioning bodies that um, are preserved. As you'll see, this is a very philosophical thought experiment. Um, <laughs> One day maybe we could do this. But, maybe. Yeah. And then finally, let's also suppose that it's possible to take someone's brain and split it in two and implant it into two other people's skulls, such that the brain will grow back fully and we'll have all the same memories as that first person did originally. In the same way as I think it's the case that you can split up a liver and the two, liver, the two separate livers will grow back and function. Or you can split up an earthworm and... I don't know if this is true, but split up an earthworm and they'll both little off. Maybe you could. Maybe you could. <laughs> um, so, okay, so you've got to imagine these kind of somewhat outlandish possibilities. But that's okay because we're illustrating a philosophical point. And so now you've got these two bodies that wake up and have all the same memories of you. From their perspective, they were just in this car crash and then woke up in a different body. And then the question is, who's you? Because supposing we think there's this you know, Cartesian soul that exists within one of us, the question would be, well, into which body does the soul go? Or even if you don't think there's a soul, but you think, no, there's something really fundamental about me, who's the me? And so there's four possible answers. 
One is that it's one brother, one sibling. Second is that it's the other sibling. Third is that it's both. Fourth is that it's neither. It couldn't be one brother or one sibling over the other because there's a parity argument. Any argument you give for saying it's um, the younger sibling would also give an argument for thinking it's the older sibling. So that can't be the case. It can't be that it's both people because, well, now I've got this person that consists of two other like, creature, like entities walking around. Uh, that seems very absurd indeed. And it can't be neither either because now imagine the case where um, you're in a car crash and your brain just gets transplanted to one person. Then you would think, well, we continue. I was in this terrible car crash, I woke up with a different body, but still me, I still have all the same memories and so on. But if it's the case that I can survive in the case of my brain being transplanted into one other person, surely I can survive if my brain is transplanted into two people. Like, it would seem weird that a double win, double success, is actually a failure. Mm. And so, tons more philosophical argument goes into this, but the conclusion that Derek Parfit ultimately makes is, there's just no fact of the matter here. This actually shows that what we think of as this continued personal identity over time is just a kind of fiction. So it's like saying when the French Socialist Party split into two. Is is there now two? You know, which one is really the French Socialist Party? We'd say, look, this is just a meaningless question. What's actually going on is that there are different parties and some of them are more similar than others. Exactly. That's right. But once you start, once you reject this idea that there's any fundamental moral difference between persons, then the fact that it's permissible for me to make a trade-off where I inflict harm on myself now, or benefit myself now in order to, you know, perhaps harm Will age 70, and let's suppose that that's actually good for me overall, well, I should make just the same trade-offs within my own life as I make across lives. Um, It would be okay to harm one person to benefit others. Um, And if you grant that, then you end up with something that's starting to look pretty similar to utilitarianism. Okay, so the basic idea is we have strong reasons to think that identity uh, doesn't exist in the way that we uh, instinctively think it does, that in fact it's just a continuum. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of exactly what utilitarianism always thought and was acting as though it was true. Yes. Uh, but but for deontological theories or virtue ethics theories, uh, that they, they really need uh, you know, a sense of identity and personhood to, to, to make sense to begin with. That's right. So yeah, another way of putting it is most non-utilitarian views require there to be like personhood as a kind of fundamental moral concept. And but, if but you think that it, concept is illusory, mm. and there seem to be these arguments to show that it is illusory, you have to reject those moral views. Yeah. Um, it would be like saying... You know, we're trying to do physics, but then denying that electrons exist or something. You have to reject that. You have to reject the underlying theory that lies in this fundamental concept. So, those are your three best arguments for utilitarianism. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, what are the best arguments against it? Uh, I mean, the best arguments against how it conflicts with common sense intuitions. Mm. So, sometimes you get kind of utilitarian <laughs> apologists, which try to ex- try to argue. So, Henry Sitwick was like this: try to argue that actually utilitarianism doesn't differ so much from common sense at all. Um, I think that's badly wrong. I think you can. Th- come up with all sorts of elaborate thought experiments, like, well, what if you can kill one person to save five, and there's no other consequences, you'll get away, and so on. And I think you should take those thought experiments seriously, and they do just conflict with common sense. But I think it also conflicts in, you know, practice as well, in particular on the beneficent side, where most people think it's not obligatory to spend money on yourself. They think that's fine. Whereas, that, is, that is not prohibited. Yeah, that's like, sorry, it's not prohibited to spend money on yourself. Whereas utilitarianism says... No, you have very strong obligations, given you know, the situation you're in at the moment, at least if you're an affluent member of a rich country, to do as much good as you can, basically. Which may um, well involve giving away a lot, lot of your money. A lot of your money, of or, de- or dedicating your career to doing as much good as possible. So it's a kind of very demanding moral view. And that's quite strictly in uh, disagreement with common sense. Mm. And even more so when you think about, you know, you're doing this to improve the lives of distant future people and so on. Are there any other, ca- other kind of arguments you want to flag? I mean, I think those are by far the most compelling. And then there's various forms of conflict with intuitions. One is it doesn't care about side constraints. A second is it's very demanding. A third is that it doesn't care about equality as an intrinsic value at all. It doesn't care about many other things as intrinsic value. I mean, yeah. It doesn't care about the environment as an intrinsic value. It doesn't care about the environment as an intrinsic value. And lots of it doesn't care about knowledge as an intrinsic value. Justice, yeah. And so lots of these things you can explain as instrumentally valuable. So... The utilitarian thinks that having an equal distribution of resources is super good from instrumental grounds because it means leads to more welfare. But if it didn't um, lead to more welfare, then they wouldn't care. Yeah, exactly. And similarly with knowledge, super important to get lots of knowledge, but important because it improves people's lives, not for its own sake. And so, you know, this all kind of comes to people thinking that 
utilitarianism is um, yeah, too thin or arid a conception of morality. I guess another thing is you, you said the, the fact that utilitarianism doesn't feature personhood as a fundamental issue or a fundamental part of yeah. the universe is an argument for it. But I imagine many people would see that as an argument against it because it's just so bizarre. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, Rawls promoted this idea of the separateness of persons. Yeah. That was his, the kind of banner label for a set of criticisms, which is all about saying, no, the real problem with utilitarianism is that it treats decisions between people as kind of isomorphic to decisions within a person, a person's life. Uh, so Rawls was writing this stuff in the 50s and 60s, and I guess Derek Parfitt did all of these personhood and identity cases in the in the 80s, in mm-hmm. Reasons and Persons. Do you think Rawls would have, would have been persuaded by those thought experiments? I think ultimately no. I mean, there's big d- disagreement among philosophers on uh, the nature of personhood, and yeah. you know, the, the idea that persons just don't exist is, is a, minority a minority view. view. Yeah. Okay. That brings me to my, to my next question, which is <laughs> philosophers just disagree about all kinds of things. They, they mm-hmm. seem to spread out over very wide range of conflicting views on almost every topic. Yeah. Uh, so how much should we believe anything that comes from your field? Yeah, I actually think the level of disagreement among philosophers is greatly overstated. Mm. I mean, there's certainly some issues on which philosophers are in really quite remarkable agreement, um, such that and in a way that's very different even from common sense. So the clearest case to me is our obligations to non-human animals, where two-thirds of philosophers believe that it's obligatory not to eat meat. Compare that to the number of people who are vegetarian. And I think a third are vegetarian. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of people who, whose beliefs aren't in, con- in congruence with their actions. But at least they agree in principle. But they agree in principle. Whereas how many would I think is the proportion in society? 5% maybe? 10%? Yeah. But I saw, a, I saw a survey of philosophers uh, mm-hmm. at one point, which I think had roughly a third sympathetic to consequence, consequentialism, roughly yeah. a third sympathetic <clears throat> to deontology, and a third sympathetic to virtue ethics or something else. Mm-hmm. It's pretty, pretty widespread. I mean, I suppose there's a lot of theories that aren't on that, on that list. Uh, so maybe there's <clears> a lot of things that have been believed over the years that, that are now rejected, and now we're down to kind of three broad categories. Yeah, that's true. So lots of people um, believe egoism, for example, mm. which is just the view that you always ought to do whatever's best for you. Extremely unpopular view in philosophy. A lot of people believe a relativist view, which is just whatever's right for me is what I believe to be right. What other people is right for them is what they believe to be right. Again, extremely unpopular view. There's views that are kind of somewhat similar that moral philosophers believe, but that's very um, that view is kind of very uncommon. I think there can on certain practical issues there's more agreement than um, there might be at the theoretical level. Do, do you want to say anything else about the, just the issue of peer disagreement within philosophy? I guess I mean your approach is just to say, well, a lot of things might be true. Like let's think, what should we do if we if we're not if we're not sure? Yeah, I think that's. Yeah, that's my view. I think it's important. I think it can be very easy to do a kind of fake updating on the basis of disagreement from peers, where you update on people who are still kind of similar to you, or you use your assumptions about what's correct to identify who appears or not. So lots of the case I hear from, I mean, particularly like virtue ethicists or particularists, and I'm just like, you could just be making noises at me for all I understand your view. Mm. And then when we talk about continental philosophy or something goes even further, I'm just like, I cannot understand like why you would think this. Oh, I can't sense, even understand what you're saying. <laughs> sometimes, yeah, for, especially for continental philosophers. That, though, could be an argument in favor of updating more. Because maybe just my brain is just wired in a certain way such that I just don't appreciate certain considerations. Mm. Whereas if someone just comes along and says, oh, you should believe you prioritarianism with a square root function. I'm like, no, I know it's not a square root function. This is just like a mistake. Mm. You, then, underst- you understand the I, error in one case, but not in the other. That's right, yeah. Mm. But I think the whole issue of peer disagreement is like extremely thorny. And it is the case that if you were just trying to read off people's philosophers' like actual views from the literature, that's very hard to do because there's so many biases mm. in what gets published. Yeah. And so I'd trust much more what people actually think rather than what they say they think in published articles. Yeah, what, what are the biases there? I mean, one that seems to me is that new philosophers have an incentive to come up with some new view, even if it's worse than the old views, because they have to stake out some new position in order, in order to have a career. There's, there's no value in just saying, yep, they were, we were right 200 years ago about this, and it's obvious. That's right. So I think that applies to utilitarianism, for example. Nick Beckstead, who you've also had on the show, he originally wanted to write a PhD, was on arguments for utilitarianism, and got strongly discouraged from doing that. Because it's like seems like flogging a dead horse. It's not original arguments for an old view. Uh, doesn't seem exciting. Is exciting, yeah, exactly. Another bias is one strong argument versus many weak arguments. Mm. So in philosophy, you just you can't really publish an article that's saying, "Hey, this is this view. I believe it because of these ten like okay arguments, but they all point in the same direction." Even though epistemically, that's actually much Very strong ground. S- strong grounds compared to the here's this one really strong argument. And then there's just tons of things that you believe but 
on the basis of like overall this worldview, how it's similar to many weak arguments, but, but you can't prove it deductively. Yeah, that's right. It, the form of the article could would look very different. And then there's just lots of things that don't get written, written about as much because it's just harder to kind of demonstrate you know, academic ability and so on in the course of doing it. So like work in practical ethics, for example, it's just very hard to show, you know, incredible kind of intellectual skills in that area compared to working on Newcomb's problem in decision theory, where you can really show off kind of intellectual skills. Mm -hmm. And so then that means that some areas are just systematically underdeveloped relative to others. Okay, so the original question was, what is your, your most unusual philosophical view? Uh, are there any idiosyncratic positions that you take that you wanted to, to bring up quickly before uh, we move on? Yeah, I mean, I guess things not to dwell on too much, but I think we should take the idea of infinite amounts of value um, much more seriously than people currently do. Um, I think there's this weird thing where there's some people in the effect of altruism community that are really on board with the idea of broadly total view level of population ethics vast amounts of people in the future maybe it's 10 to the power 100 lives or something and we should really be aiming to achieve that and like basically nothing else matters apart from getting to that goal but the idea of infinite amounts of value in achieving that is just absurd it's like no, so who would be so be crazy silly, to believe that whereas i think all of the arguments for thinking that um we should be pursuing this finite but extremely large amount of value um, seem to also argue in favor of trying to produce infinite amounts of positive value as well and then that means you can go one of two ways you can either say, oh, yeah, we should, and maybe that leads to radically different conclusions because mm. we're thinking about this very different aim. Or instead, you can go the other way and say, well, actually, what this shows is that we really don't know Jack about what's morally valuable. And instead, what we want to do is preserve option value, try and give ourselves time to really pursue, to figure out what's morally correct. And so that can still act as an argument for reducing extinction risk because it's just buying us time to do hard work of moral philosophy. Mm. But it's a very different style of argument, I think. Mm. I'm planning to have Amanda Askell on the on the oh, show to, to talk about the infinite issues. So okay, maybe let's move on from that. All right. So we started talking about like problems in in academia, the, mm -hmm. the bad incentives that academics have. Mm -hmm. I, I guess you've been a professor now for about for about two years. That's right. Yeah. What are some of the downsides of of being a professor? I mean, so many mm -hmm. people want to become academics, right? It's like a very romanticized uh, profession. But yeah. Presumably, it, the, the day to day life can actually be have some serious problems. Yeah, I think that's totally right. Um, I definitely think that most people who aspire to be a professor have a very different understanding of what it's like compared to how it actually is. Certainly, I, that was the case for me age 21. So most people who become philosophy professors... So firstly, it's just how hard it is to get that sort of position. Base, it's like trying to become a musician or an athlete or something. You're doing something that a very large number of people want to do. So firstly, it's just a very good chance you're just not going to be able to find a position. A lot of it is randomness as well because there's so many good candidates. Um, you know, I managed to get this position. Very large amounts of luck just in the course of this in terms of articles getting accepted at good journals, in terms of, you know, who was on the hiring committee and their sympathetic sympathy to my project versus other projects and so on. So that's one big thing. And then secondly is what you actually end up doing, which is the vast majority of professors are spending most of their time doing teaching and administration at most universities. And that's even at Oxford as well. Most tutorial fellows, which is the position I used to be on, that's maybe 50% of your time is spent either doing teaching, including one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two teaching to first-year undergraduates, or dealing with a lot of, you know, quite menial stuff, like setting up tutorials for different students. Often things that seemingly could be done by people who aren't academics, <laughs> or by software, actually, because mm. universities are often, you know, a decade or more behind technological um, state-of-the-art. And often just, yeah, boring bureaucratic meetings as well, are definitely part of many meetings where I could have been replaced with a sack of potatoes and um, I would have done as good a job as I was there. Um, so there's, you know, universities are these, are these huge bureaucracies and sadly that means there's just like tons of waste in the system in a way that, you know, most academics find very frustrating. Then it's also the case that you do have, an, you have to play this game, which is publishing articles, which has so many significant problems with it. Like, you know, my uh, second major publication the time, length of time between me submitting that and it getting published was five years. <laughs> and so insofar as I actually think that this stuff is really important, I want people to learn about this. I want people to build on this and I want people to criticize me to figure out where I'm wrong. Yeah. If the lag is five years, yeah. I'm just not really going to learn very much. Yeah, um, I was going to say, it's a, it's a bit of a shame if this article is highlighting a moral catastrophe and you're just like waiting for it to get published oh, and like, taking yeah, five years just yeah, sitting on the exactly, draft. Exactly. Yeah. And then similarly related to certain things that you can publish, certain things you can't, very strong incentives to only work in areas that you can really demonstrate intellectual chops, at least until you get to the point where you're much safer mm. in your intellectual position. 
Oh, the other thing is, again, like, it just is the case that in academia, lots of the things that you think you won't have to deal with, if you, you know, unlike in the corporate world or something, you actually do, like, things like, you know, how many people do you know? And, like, how wide is your academic network? Mm. I think it's not as strong a predictor of success as in other disciplines, mm. like, you know, the corporate world and so on. It does make a difference. Like, people like to hire people they know are good. Like, so you've still got to kind so of work on. the room, no matter how smart you are. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously that's a very kind of mercenary way of putting it. But people who go to a lot of conferences and get to know a lot of people, they do have more success. And, you know, that's... Often people want to go into academia because they, like, really find that sort of stuff makes them sick. Mm. But, um, sadly, it, it does happen. Yeah, so a lot of the ways the kind of life of an academic is much more constrained than you might think. But there's tons of, like, really good things as well. So... Lots of the things that academics want to do, it's just very hard. Because of the history and like institutions that have been built around academia, it means you can get to a certain quality of research and thought that's very hard otherwise. So, you know, you've got to jump through all of these hoops, like getting, a P- like getting into a really top PhD program, getting a good PhD, submitting to these like journals. And then that means that you've got a way of kind of all of this different information that you could be engaging with or different people you could be engaging with. You've got this kind of filtering system such that lots of the hard work of like what the things that you can really, should really be paying your attention on, um, lots of that hard work has been done for you. And so my kind of impression with like intellectual research outside of academia is that you can make a ton more progress more quickly if you're focused on something that academics aren't focused on. So like the question of what charity does the most good with your money? Academics aren't going to work on that question. And so if you want the state of the art, just don't do that within academia. But then there's questions that academics do work on and often you get like very high quality of research on, like metaethics, for example. And you're only going to like, when there's an area that academics is suitable for academics to work on, then the highest quality thought it seems to me, is actually going to be find, found within academia. And it's hard, and it's, yeah, it's really hard to do that independently. I guess you could try to found a new academic discipline of figuring out what the best charity is, but that's, that's very difficult to do, even though it would be quite valuable if you could. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we are trying to set up a new research field of effective altruism or global priorities research. But if it, the field was what's the best charity, like top academics are not going to want to go into that because it's not a very good way of demonstrating your intellectual chops. There are interesting theoretical questions like the question of giving now versus later or population ethics or um, low probabilities of high amount of value, you know, tons of important open questions. But the ones that are going to get attention are the theoretical questions, the ones that like fundamental or have like broader, you know, significance and so on. I guess 80,000 hours is kind of filling a very similar gap as well. It's not that we're smarter than academics. It's just that academics really haven't tried to answer the concrete applied questions that we're trying to work on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you can think of that more like think tank work or something. Because again, you know, the stuff that 80,000 hours is producing is like really good and really important um, and making a lot of progress in this area. It just doesn't have the right fit for academia. Not really. I mean, I kind of tried this. I did write an article on the case for earning to give, um, which did get published. But it's like, you know, by far the publication that's least prestigious in terms of the venue that it got compared to my other work. And I did have to like shoehorn a lot of the ideas into a way that feels academically or philosophically appropriate. Um, So it it is very constraining in that regard. And sometimes that even applies to things that you might think philosophers should work on. So what are the actual concrete implications of utilitarianism? Really trying to work them through. Remarkably, that just really hadn't been done. Like Peter Singer did it a bit, but actually there was tons tons more that he could have said, whereas Philosophia, this utilitarianism fault for them, which was a bunch of smart people who were really concerned about this question, I actually think was just better than the state of the art in Even though a lot of them were just undergraduates. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So again, the question is just, is there low-hanging fruit here or not? Uh, you mentioned earlier that universities are often like a decade or two or maybe 10 mm-hmm. behind behind the state of the art in kind of corporate efficiency. Yeah, the incentives are just misaligned kind of all over the place. I mean, I guess so. like the University of Oxford is not going to go out of business from competition. Yeah, so it's exactly. not, its feet aren't held to the fire yeah. to yeah, be good, like have good operations. Yeah. And another thing is uh, the admissions process. So I've acted as an interviewer twice for uh, Oxford undergraduate admissions. And it's a real shame that that isn't more evidence-based where there's various factors to consider. One is school performance, second is standardized tests that we ask the students to set, and then thirdly is an interview. And there's actually data. So one thing Oxford does that's great is has gathered data on which of these things predict um, performance in their final exams. And they give um, interviewers the algorithm. And it turns out that the relative weight that you should give 
to the test versus the interview is eight to one. So the tests are vastly b- better at predicting who does well than the interview. But then what happens in practice? Well, all the decisions are made immediately after you have interviewed people. And so that means that people have just had this huge bias of seeing someone right in front of them, including all of the potential stereotype biases that involves, where it's extremely notable how much better the interview people from uh, elite private schools are than public schools. In a way that's very unsurprising, because they have had those sorts of conversations over dinner every night of their lives, where there's people from comprehensive schools have often just never had an intellectual conversation like the one they have in an interview. Even if they could do a good test or write an essay about it. Even if they could do a good test, exactly. And then the decisions are made immediately afterwards. And many people don't even know that there's this algorithm because the idea is just buried in you know, vast amounts of other... And I suppose many of them aren't statisticians and don't appreciate how this functions. Yeah, exactly. Or they aren't aware of just how weak the evidence is for the epi- the value, the predictive value of interviews, of unstructured interviews. And so what I did was just put it in the algorithm and I came up with a ranking and um, really didn't, you know, I quoted the interview the one-ninth weight that it deserved. And uh, at least, you know, the second time we did it, when I was the primary interviewer for philosophy, I just kind of stood by that ranking and held my ground. And maybe at the the border, you can tweak it in various ways. And luckily, that is how we made offers, in fact. Uh, So you managed to convince your colleagues. I did eventually manage to convince my colleagues. But it was like a several-hour conversation about this, Hmm. where... The temptation to say, look, I met this person and they seemed like a genius to me. In the 20-minute conversation. In the 20-minute conversation I had. Who cares about their grades that were the basis of two years of work or the test that's actually, you know, got amazing predictive power? And it's incredibly, like, who gains here? Because it's incredibly costly for the academics and the universities. well, I mean, to do Oxford so many is, interviews as well. Oxford is also criticised, probably rightly, for you know not having a like sufficiently diverse range of uh, applicants or people who are admitted. Uh, yeah. Like you know, tend, tending to take people from the upper class. It just seems like changing the algorithm or changing the process here would be a really easy way to do that and get smarter students. That's as right. Well. So you could get rid of admissions interviews. I think we would improve the quality of students that came to Oxford. I think it would be more diverse and it would save vast amounts of time mm. from academics. And this is a good example of just being beholden to the tradition where the like terribly difficult Oxford interview Cambridge interview is kind of part of what creates this elite you know this mystique around the university we've done it this way for 400 years since before we even had the mathematical tools to do a better job so why not just continue well exactly yeah, yeah. so there's a huge amount of inertia so uh, a couple of years ago you wrote an article for 80,000 hours kind of discouraging people from going into philosophy but then mm-hmm. you've become a philosopher yourself would, yeah. you, would you want to revise what you had to say there at all uh I actually I do want to revise it a little bit, not because of my own case. I think it's a terrible idea to make general recommendations on the basis of... N equals one. Um, N equals one. Especially when the only reason you're in a position to make recommendations like this is that you happen to have been successful. Um, actually, I could go on a long rant about this. Yeah. And, like, it's I, like getting careers advice from the world's best marathon runner who's like, yes, anyone can do it. Just, yeah, exactly. just become a marathon runner. It'll be great. And this is huge in careers advice. So I'm in this book, Tools of Titans by Tim Ferriss which is all about sampling on the dependent variable and looking at like people, incredibly successful people and seeing what they did. And, and I bet they took very big risks. Isn't that right? <laughs> yeah. Look at the, the Airbnb took- co-founders. They kind of boast of how they had these like uh, baseball card binders full of credit cards where they'd taken out huge amounts of debt. But they were lucky and they pushed their heads and it's basically then were the equivalent like successful. of trying to decide whether it's good to uh, go to the casino by only talking to people who won the roulette table. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I'd love to have... And, and I'd say, you should yeah. bet as much as you can. <laughs> yeah, bet yeah. all of it on that's, a single round. That's right, because that's what I did and that was incredibly successful. Yeah. No, what I would love to see is a podcast called Stories of Failure, where they take people where it really looked propitious, like mm. they were going to have a big success, and then it just crashed and burned. And then really identifying why that happened. Mm. So I think it would involve lessons like, don't break the law. (laughs) That's like, (laughs) first lesson to, you know, to be successful, don't break the law. That's a really dumb idea. uh, Probably don't try heroin. Don't try heroin. Don't take out loads of debt. I mean, (laughs) this is not the stuff that you get if you just look at the most successful people. Um, That's right. So I've been super lucky. Um, There's no doubt in that. I can... We could talk about many instances where I've been very lucky in terms of getting the position that I've got. And I do think... So in that article... What I said was two things. One, I think the value of doing philosophy, in particular moral philosophy, is extremely high. I think if you look at the track record and look at the mean kind of contribution of philosophers rather than the median, I think the median is close to zero. The mean is extremely high. You've got Aristotle, um, you've got Mill, Bentham. Like We're working out what we ought to do as a society. 
And given how incredibly important that question is, it gets almost no attention in terms of use of resources. The question, though, is just, can you actually become a philosopher? And there, the, just the prospects are kind of really hard. Like, even if you get into a top philosophy program, it's very hard to then move into a kind of research position. So I think since then, I think the case is somewhat better, mainly because effective altruist ideas have become it. Like, if this is what you want to work on. Those ideas are becoming more mainstream, we're more able to bring in funding at organizations like the Future of Humanity Institute or the Global Priorities Institute. And so there's a greater potential to have non-standard academic roots if you're working on these topics, which are very important, because there are people who see the value of doing this sort of research. So that's at least more compelling. The second thing that's different now as well is um, in terms of a ratio of philosophers to other people in the community, where, you know, when Effective Altruism started off, we were kind of we talk about being non-diverse. We were, we were mainly 100% philosophers. philosophers. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, <laughs> Maybe we should branch out into having an economist. Yeah, exactly. That's right. So whereas what's happened is that the number of philosophers has grown very slowly, I think. Very slowly since like a couple of years ago. We really took off in philosophy and it kind of saturated a little bit. Whereas effective altruism in general has grown a lot. So I actually think like marginal philosophers have like a ton to contribute compared to other things. I suppose another thing so, is, it yeah. seems like even if you can't get a good philosophy academic job, there's, there's a really strong track record of people who've studied philosophy and done pretty well going out and doing really useful research in other areas. Yeah. Maybe not in academia, but in a think tank or in a foundation or something Yeah, like that. or Open Philanthropy Project, which mm. has hired a number of philosophers. But then the question is, is it still the best thing to go into? I think for someone who could go into either philosophy or economics, even if it took an extra year because you did a conversion course or something, it still does seem that the case for going into philosophy would just be if you're like, I am a philosopher, this is what I think about all the time, or like when I'm taking time off, or like what I want to do is just read philosophy, and I don't have much interest in other disciplines, then like still go into philosophy. But if you're kind of more unsure either way, it's hard not to make the case for economics. And the reason is threefold. One is just there's way more jobs in economics. Mm. The ratio between academic jobs and PhDs is much closer to parity. Second is that there's much better options. You know, you can go into government, go into uh, think tanks and so on. Much more demand there. Thirdly, I do just think you... Yeah, thirdly is like the even fewer economists than there are philosophers in EA, and I think we really benefit from that a lot. And then I do just think the skills you learn are better. You know, I think philosophical skills are really important, but... Um, They're a bit fragile, I think. Economists learn to kind of weigh evidence from many different sources, do a bit of theory, a bit of empirical work, which is like more what you're doing in day-to-day -day life. Yeah, that's right. And then finally, it's easier to switch from economics to philosophy than the other way around. Mm -hmm. So my old supervisor was an economist originally and then became a philosopher. But I just don't see how it could be possible to move from philosophy into economics. Okay, so let's move on from academia. I think it might be great to get you on next year to talk about how you can go about trying to become an academic and perhaps you know, being sure. a public intellectual, getting in the media, writing books, that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. Uh, but that's kind of a big topic in, its, in itself. Let's talk a bit about the, the EA community. So mm -hmm. you've been involved, I guess, for, for six years, kind of since the beginning. You've seen how it's changed over the mm -hmm. years. What kinds of things would you like to, to see it do differently? Do, do you think you know, we've gone down, down any, any bad directions that we mm -hmm. need to correct? Yeah, so I think there's a few things... The biggest thing it seems to me at the moment is this discrepancy or kind of lag between, on the one hand, there's the kind of most core people in effective altruism, often people working at organizations like Open Philanthropy and 80,000 Hours and Center for Effective Altruism and people very close in there. And then there's kind of wider effective altruism community that maybe aren't, you know, somewhat engaged and pursuing effective altruism in their own lives. And then even further again, there's kind of how outside, like people external to the community then see it and think of what we're doing. People who've just read one or two news articles. Yeah, about. exactly. And there's a really big spread here where people in the core, like there's a very, you know, striking amount of agreement on a couple of things. So one is taking the long-termism perspective very seriously, where that means that most of the value of the actions that you do today are how they impact the, very, the value of the very long run of human civilization. And where that means that doing things like trying to reduce existential risks, trying to promote like a really flourishing civilization with a particular focus on biological risks and artificial intelligence is just, you know, basically there's very wide agreement on that within the kind of core. Yeah, Whereas, we recently did a survey of uh, yeah. people who are a core part of, uh, of effective altruism, and it seemed like there was about 80 or 90% agreed with that view. Yeah, so that's pretty notable. And then now let's just go all the way to how, say, the media perceives EA, which is almost exactly the opposite, remarkably. 
And, you know, that form of view, it's like informed by a lot of theoretical considerations, philosophical arguments, and so on. But then the media perception of EA, which I'm, you know, sure helped to contribute to, but many years ago now, is, oh, EA is about only looking at short-term benefits that you can measure very clearly using randomized controlled trials, and it's about earning as much as possible in order to donate to those sorts of organizations, even though, again, now the kind of core is just placing a lot more importance on doing direct work rather than learning to give because, you know, Open Philanthropy is advising a $10 billion foundation. We've done very, very well at, like, raise, at raising money and we have this kind of funding overhang. And then, you know, as you kind of move into the core, you've got this kind of spectrum of how much people, how much people's views are similar to the kind of uh, media's views with EA is about earning to give to donate to RCT back charities and doesn't care about long run at all or versus about the core. politics or, you know, or about changing po- laws or so changing cultural norms. Politics is another one where, um, again, people in the core community are very serious about the importance of ensuring that political institutions work really well and that like political action is sensible and positive from a very long perspective, from a very long term perspective. But again, the kind of stereotype that people see is like, oh, EA doesn't care about that at all because it's not measurable or something. I used to read articles in the mass media about effective altruism, and I kind of had to stop just for my own health because it was just just bad for my blood pressure to read people just condemning like the thing that I'm a part of on the basis of their understanding it to be the complete opposite of what it actually is. That's right. It's It's just infuriating. It's really frustrating. I mean, so it's kind of half inevitable where, you know, messages are like light or something, and then the people in the media may be looking back I mean, what's now, you know, six years or something to kind of really the views we were championing earlier, early on. And then partly, I think it's just laziness in terms of not engaging with what we actually think, where there's still there is this lag. There's tons of views that we kind of haven't codified in writing and so on. But we've definitely been making a bunch of progress. And if someone were actually to, um, you know, speak with core people and like actually get up to speed with um, the articles like 80,000 Hours have been releasing, which have been, think have been excellent just, they would see that this kind of stereotype is just badly, badly misguided. Just to, to give a sense of how bad it can be, there, there was someone who wrote years ago that we were too similar to Charity Navigator, uh, this, <laughs> this website which just looks at um, whether charities are fraudulent or not. Wow. Or I mean, that and, was just never... I mean, the we we were like mortal that, enemies at the exactly, time. Exactly. Uh, we had like written furious argu- uh, like, uh, articles criticizing one another. Yeah, uh, exactly. But that's the level of engagement that you often get, that they don't even know that yeah. we're like the antithesis of this other thing that they're saying that we're exactly the same as. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then that kind of percolates into the wider community a bit as well, where... You know, like we, you know, one of the reasons we set up um, Effective Altruism Funds at Centre for Effective Altruism was so that we could give a more accurate representation of the sorts of causes that the really core people think are most important, which isn't just, you know, extreme poverty, but um, also taking the long run future and trying to ensure that goes as well as possible and farm animal welfare as well. Improving, improving people's decision making ability, especially in government or important institutions, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the kind of second side, which is, I think, again, people see the long run future people. And again, they think of this like loony, like the only thing that matters is that whatever tiny probability you can increase of 10 to the 100 lives in the future, that's the only thing we should be working on. Whereas that's, again, just not really the view of the core people, which is much more like, yes, we think the long run future is very important. Don't be crazy about this. Like, we've got tons of uncertainty. Here are the ways we could be wrong. These are the things we should be exploring. Like, I'm very ex- interested in uh, what Nick Bexley called broad existential risk reduction, where that means general societal improvements, like improving voting systems or the competency of people who get into positions of power or ability to coordinate, that look good across a very wide array of outcomes for the future of civilization, such that looks like a really good thing, even if we've done a terrible job now of predicting what technologies mm. are going to be important over the coming decades. And that's just a very different kind of tone and spirit than what is this kind of straw man of the very long run future view. So that's how the media is misunderstanding us. Uh, what, what's kind of been our, our biggest mistake ourselves? Yeah, um, in my own case, when I think of the big mistakes, one I think was aggressive marketing around earning to give. I think that was a bit childish almost, is how I think about that. And, you know, we really suffered that cost. Yeah, people that lingered. to this day think that 80,000 hours is all about earning to give, whereas yeah. we've explicitly written articles saying we think most people shouldn't earn to give. That's right. And that's from being, you know, more contrarian in our initial marketing, yeah. which is now like six years ago. <laughs> so I think not appreciating just how long mm. 
certain bad messages can stick around Maybe for Maybe I'll as still well. be 50 and people will be telling me that 80,000 hours thinks everyone should end together. It yeah. will just never end. Yeah, It'll exactly. be punished forever. Yeah. Um, I mean, from my own perspective, there were certain things that involved coordinating with other groups in the early days that had different geographies. Like, I just wish I'd talked to GiveWell and so much more in the early days of giving what we can. But, you know, they were all the way in New York at the time and... That just created this unnecessary division between giving what we can and give well. And, and I guess and similarly it, with it, other groups as well. It means that the only time you talk is when there's a real issue, when someone's exactly, frustrating yeah. someone else. Yeah, and especially because, you know, I, we were young, like I was mm. 23 or something, and there were some things like this famous controversy over the figures giving what we can were using in terms of the cost to avert a dally from some programs. Mm. Where, you know, give well did tremendous research, really digging into that and actually showing that surprisingly the academic estimates were really based on very flimsy estimates, like real mistakes were being made. And then giving what we can was just incredibly slow, sluggish to respond to that, mainly just because we've like had a poor understanding of, you know, that wasn't malice in any way, a desire to mislead people, but we're just like, oh, we don't know how to deal with this situation. Mm. And then I think, yeah, also, yeah, something we're kind of still kind of changing is then the messaging to be maybe quicker about um, ensuring the messaging we're broadcasting represents kind of the views of at least the cutting edge of EA at the moment. Mm. So perhaps we could be quicker at updating that so that there's less of a lag. But like speaking of the cutting edge, there's kind of a bunch of touchy issues that EA can end up delving mm. into. I guess an example that jumps to mind is uh, many people involved in effective altruism are concerned with the suffering of animals in the wilderness yeah. uh, and yeah. can end up saying, you know, maybe the wilderness isn't as good as, it, as it's cut out to be. In fact, it, it could be very bad, at least for, for some species. Yeah. And if, if, you, if you try to put that into the mass media, then yeah. you, get, yeah. you get like very acerbic uh, pushback on that because yeah. you're basically yeah. – uh, a lot of people place a lot of intrinsic value on nature mm-hmm. and you're, you're kind of saying that something they think is sacred is, is actually not good. Yeah. Uh, there's like other examples like that. Whenever you're, you know, seriously engaging in philosophy, sometimes you're going to reach kind of intrinsic oh, yeah, conclusions. Absolutely. Is this something that we should embrace? Should we talk about these kind of controversial, uh, interesting philosophical cases a lot? So Peter Singer has done this throughout his career. He's kind of courted a bit of controversy here and there. Yeah. Uh, so I think there's two things to say. So one is I think it's absolutely crucial for us to be able to like responsibly explore all sorts of ideas. Precisely because, again, you know, looking in the past, we've the idea that homosexuality should be decriminalized. What what monster? Not like Bentham saying that. Just not only is it like well, weird guy, but actually would have got tons of vitriol as a result. He could have gone to prison. Could have gone to prison. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. So extremely um, important to be able. You know, we have a moral responsibility to explore ideas, even if they seem weird, even if they seem pretty toxic. But that doesn't mean that just like anything goes, we should shout out whatever contrarian things we like. And it definitely doesn't mean we should kind of take joy in contrarian ideas. And so what I just kind of think is we should have a floating parameter of how much care do you take about this message? You know, so if you've got something that's just not very important and potentially very controversial, potentially offensive even to people, then just don't, there's no need to talk about it. If it is important though, it is important to talk about it. In which case, just take a lot of care over how you're saying things. Think about how people could react and respond to it. So unfortunately, you can even do this. So I mean, I think Jeff McMahon's piece on wild animal suffering was actually, I thought it was very careful, but people still, and he went at great pains to say, I'm not saying at all we should do anything about this. I'm not saying we should like intervene in nature at all. We've got no idea what the consequences could be. He said that over and over again. But then still, it was the case that got huge amounts of flack from saying, what, you're saying we should just destroy nature or kill all predators or something? Showing they hadn't even kind of read the article. So it's, it's hard to do, but you can at least kind of try your best. But I think it is really important to do that because if you're being a kind of contrarian, you're taking delight in the fact that people are getting riled up. You're doing a disservice to those really important ideas. Yeah, I think effective altruism tends to disproportionately attract people who love kind of controversial debate and really, you know, yeah. exploring exploring controversial ideas. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I was like that when I was younger and I... I, I, I you, don't, <laughs> you don't say. Um, I've never seen... I've known, yeah. I think the thing that's, that's really bad is when you find what might be an important idea that's kind of controversial and mm-hmm. then for attention or for like the pleasure of uh, yeah. you know, pointing out how people are wrong, you make it seem even more controversial than it is and, yeah, and you're yeah, very yeah. glib about it and don't yeah, even yeah. really explain and justify the view, which, you know, is something that, I, that I'm guilty of, especially when I was younger. Yeah. And that's, uh, it's very harmful and just kind of mean-spirited, I think. It's very immature. Yeah, and but all, yeah, very harmful. I mean, as an example, I think, take the arguments for the importance of the juicing extinction risk, where many people in EA were very slow to realize the power of those arguments because they've been presented in an unduly contrarian way. 
because they'd been presented as, well, even if a probability is one in a million that you can do anything about this, then because the amount of value is just so great, you should still do it. Look, that's just, for most people, not a very compelling argument at all. There are other arguments that are much better. Mm. And so you've done a disservice to this very important idea. Are there any other problems or mistakes being made by the EA community that, that you think we need to address pretty fast? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing which EA has taken some flack on, um, but that I do think is important, is diversity. Um, two types. One is kind of racial and gender diversity, and second is kind of epistemic diversity. And I think both are very important for different reasons. The first is just in terms of, like, we want this community to be, like, you know, big and influential because we think these ideas are really important. In my own case, if I thought, oh, there's a community, these ideas are really excited, and then I go and just, like, you know, everyone's black and although referring to, like, cultural references that I don't understand and so on. Like, just human psychology is going to make it natural. That's going to be, you know, you're going to feel like, oh, this is less my people, or maybe I don't fit, I feel unwelcome or so on. Mm. Even more extreme than the other way around. Mm. And so, you know, I do think this is something we should be kind of aiming towards. And I think it's tricky in some ways, especially because, you know, effective altruism is a significant part kind of what to do if you're in a position of privilege. Mm. So, you know, it's no coincidence that we're targeting people who are, have, you know, tremendous resources that they don't need that um, could be used to do a ton of good. I mean, they're the people who have the greatest obligation to do this stuff. Because, absolutely, because yeah. Absolutely. They don't need to look after themselves anymore. That's like, absolutely. We're not targeting people who are living on the poverty line in rich countries. They've got their own shit to deal with. Yeah. Like, and, so, and then I think the key thing, um, and the most important thing, which I think is good anyway, is just ensuring that EA as a community is um, very welcoming and very friendly to people with kind of diverse backgrounds, where that means limiting the use of jargon, not letting that become a kind of shibboleth or like password for entering the community, ensuring that like if someone comes and says something that we think is like a mistake, people don't just like jump on them and criticize them a ton, but like um, a much more kind of friendly and polite. And then also just acknowledging uncertainty like a lot more, I think, um, again, can help in that, help for these aims quite a bit more as well. Just generally being welcome and not being not being arrogant. Which is an easy trap to fall into. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when um, you, if you're hanging out with people who tend to agree with you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm trying to really avo- avoid both kind of cultural and epistemic kind of groupthink. So finally, I know you've got to go in a minute, but what's what's the best argument against effective altruism in your view? Great. So I think there are um, a couple of different ways you can criticize EA. One is just saying the theory is wrong, and the second is saying, well, okay, theoretically it makes sense, but then in practice there's some big mistakes. On the theory being wrong, the most compelling way in which it could be badly wrong is if we're under obligations of justice that are so strong that thinking about beneficence or doing good is just kind of wrong. Instead, what we ought to be doing is rectifying injustice, where the analogy is, suppose that you know, you're very rich, and that's because you stole a million dollars. And then I say, well, what you ought to be thinking about is how much can you do, how can you do as much good as possible with that million dollars? Many moral views would say that's not the right way of thinking. Instead, you ought to be giving, you ought to be rectifying that injustice. You ought to give back that money. Um, and possibly, at least, the same is true for us in rich countries. You know, we inherited this wealth. We don't own it. The causal history of that wealth has, like, tons of really dodgy uh, aspects to it, involvement in colonialism and so on. And maybe then, at least, well, again, we ought to be, you know, really using our resources as much as we can, but to rectify that injustice rather than do good. And now I take that perspective pretty seriously, and I've tried to think about it as much as I can. It doesn't seem to me personally that that actually comes apart very significantly, where, you know, one of the injustices is the horrific suffering we're inflicting on farm animals. One of the injustices is that we're kind of playing Russian roulette with um, the future of human civilization. That could kill lots that of other ki- people that could who kill aren't lots responsible of other for people. it. Exactly, that's fine. Or, you know, maybe the injust- injustice we're just focusing on um, the global poor. Well, you can't literally give money back to those who we, um, open quote, stole it from because they're not around. Like, what instead can you do? It's at least a safe option to say, well, I'm going to do it in whatever way will benefit people as much as possible. You might say, okay, you have extra worries about paternalism there. But again, kind of health and um, cash transfers look pretty good on the kind of anti-paternalistic grounds as well. I guess, so you might not know exactly who was treated most unjustly, but it's a reasonable bet that maybe it's the people who are worst off. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Um, So that's at least safe. And then the second is, well, EA in practice, where a couple of things here. One is just, okay, we're trying to do the most good, and that's meant to be pretty theory neutral. But then as it happens, I think many people in EA at least are very sympathetic to consequentialism, or at least have the brains that are sympathetic to consequentialism, even if they try and um, take other moral viewpoints very seriously. 
But clear that could introduce some additional biases in terms of how we're reasoning about things. So there the idea would be maybe if you have this kind of thick non-consequentialist view or very different way of reasoning, you'd end up coming to very different conclusions. Mm. And, you know, I think we don't want to... We don't want to pretend that we're saying, well, any way of doing the most good will therefore lead to this particular set of recommendations. Mm. And instead, sometimes, you know, being explicit, like, well, we, what we'd love is people with very different value systems to try and go through this entire process. Mm. And it's a bit of a shame that the criticisms so far um, from people who do find the whole approach, like, weird, have instead been, like, from a distance, kind of lobbing grenades. Um, or is it, we might than, like them to say, I don't agree, and here's what you should think instead. Or, yeah, exactly. Or, I'd, be so, I'd be so interested in that. Because even when I put on my non-consequentialist hat and try and reason through, it seems to me like these are still, the things we recommend are still really pretty good. But maybe you're it, just kidding yourself. But yeah, but maybe I'm, I'm still biased in certain ways. Mm. And I do weigh that, for example, in wild animal suffering or something. If, you know, it was the case that you were really interfering in nature, and that really conflicts with you know, an environmentalist worldview or something. I would think that's a reason against doing it because it's not morally cooperative with other sets of values mm. and there's a moral uncertainty reason against. Mm. And, and a reason to delay because it's irreversible. Yeah, absolutely. And then maybe the second argument could be, you know, and we have been moving already in this direction, but, you know, effective altruism definitely started off with a focus on charity and individual donation. And the argument could have been, well, like governments, like we're talking to, you know, which, you know, relatively affluent people, um, people with potentially a lot of influence, the amount of influence you can have um, in expected value terms by just forgetting about this charity stuff, just trying to influence what governments do, is just so much greater that even though you can't get reliable feedback and so on, even though it's going to be a low probability, the value of that is just so much greater. And so therefore, you know, going around saying, hey, give to charity all this good stuff you can do. Maybe that was actually bad because it takes away attention from other things. Again, I don't think that is true because I think we've managed to create this community of people who are really dedicated about improving the world and are now thinking about how very seriously and taking action on how can you do that with respect to improving government policies as well. But it's at least, like I think, a reasonable argument that people could make. I guess another possibility is we've just chosen the wrong problems to try to solve, uh, to focus on. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that, that's that's the idea of cause X cause that X. kind of promoted. Although that's right. I mean, I think that's... Um, I mean... I can easily get myself into a state where I think it's overwhelmingly likely that we've chosen the wrong mm. problems to focus on. Again, because I'm just so aware of just how impoverished our both moral and empirical knowledge is. Mm. And so the idea of cause X is some cause such that we think it just completely is just way better. Maybe we haven't even conceptualized it yet. Maybe it's something that we saw and then really dismissed that we just think is of far, far greater moral importance than even the top causes we promote just now. Um, and I think that one thing we should really be trying to do as a community is try and figure out what that might be. Yeah, maybe maybe next time we can uh, survey some of the options there, see if any of them are any of them are plausible. Love to do that. Right. My guest today has been Will McCaskill. Thanks Thank for you. coming on the podcast. Uh, well, thanks so much. If you enjoyed that, please post the episode to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or the blockchain. Or maybe message a friend letting them know about the show and recommending they check it out. Kieran Harris helped edit and produce today's show. Thanks so much. Talk to you next week.